Hey, strangers. Welcome to another episode of The Strange Sessions. As always, I am Kurt, and I am joined by my lovely co-host, Quarantine Krista. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. This is actually our second attempt at the episode because <laughs> I forgot to turn my auto recording on last time, so it was not recording. But we are recording now. I can see the dial going up so we're good so thank, thank goodness you noticed that now because that uh, would have been really tragic I, after we got done I'd be like uh, where'd the episode go <laughs> so let's do that all over again <laughs> okay but we're good now it is recording so Wait. how are you I'm okay just okay how are you yeah getting stir crazy you know I know I know uh we were talking before in our non-recorded episode that you actually <laughs> got out of the house for a little while which was on nice. monday yep yep i basically go to the grocery store once a week and i go to work once a week just for a yeah. few hours and that's how that's how i get out of the house so for the most part i'm home except for two days a week that's nuts i go to the grocery store every day even if i don't need to just to go do something i know human interaction right yeah just to, to be around other people because i love narnia at the death but i can only be around her so much before <sighs> i need it Something else. Yeah, my Lucy has been very needy lately, so I find myself shutting myself in my home office just so I, you know, she can't get to me. Get a little <laughs> time away. Yeah, I know how it is. Exactly. I can't imagine having kids home while you're trying to work. That just sounds like a nightmare. Oh, God. No yeah. offense. I'm sure it's great, but uh, I just couldn't handle it. <laughs> I hear ya. I hear ya. So anything else new and exciting? Uh, no. <laughs> Me nope. either. Me either. Um, I want to thank everybody who gave us feedback on the last episode that we released about the sound quality. Um, I realized that my microphone isn't as loud as Krista's, but once I get my new microphone, that should hopefully be fixed. Uh, we're still dealing with microphone issues. Krista's yeah. got to hold hers in front of her face. Otherwise, it's loud rubbing against yeah. her clothes. I just figured out how to drape it over my laptop, though, so it hangs right in front of my mouth without me having to... I'm using earbuds that have, like, a little speaker thing on it, so that's why nice. it's, like, hitting my shirt or I move my hair. Apparently, it sounds like I'm eating popcorn on nice. Christmas. And I have my <laughs> my headphones on that have the built-in microphone that I bought when I used to play uh, Elder Scrolls online with friends. Nice. But it's uh, once I get a new microphone, things should be better. We got really good feedback, though. I mean, some people said it was great. Others said I sound like I was in a closet or a tin can or something, but <laughs> yep. they were just happy to get content. So. Yes, this is the best we can do for now. So hopefully exactly. this should be OK. And we're not going to do shout outs to new members. We're going to save all that for when we're together in person, which should hopefully be soon. I don't know. I'm hoping. So uh, today we just have a couple of shout outs that Krista is going to do. So knock yourself out. So we got, so each of us got a little package in the mail. Um, did. Mine, did yours come with a letter? Yes. OK, so I'm going to read the letter. I posted this on um, Instagram and Facebook. So it says, hi, Krista, one of our local strangers has a wood and leather business. And when I saw this on their page, I knew you and Kurt needed one. I also found this, in parentheses, new, pick a lip balm, and thought you must have it also. Haha. Ha. Stay safe and stay strange. Kate. Um, and it says, let me clarify this new. It has been in my house for who knows how long. <laughs> but it is sealed, so open at your own risk, I guess. Um, so this is Kate uh, Verhels. She is the wife of Jeff, who I uh, did Paranormal Palaver with. Um, yeah, but yeah. she's so sweet. She always shares our episodes with everybody on her Facebook page, which is so nice. She is. She's um, super sweet. I adore her. Yeah. Never met so her, but I really like her. Oh, uh, you would love her. Yeah. She's just as sweet as in, in person as she is on the Internet. So. Oh, so awesome. shout out to Kate, but also shout out to Cassandra Ann and Joe Timber. And I believe... The business card that came with um, the little, it's a little Bigfoot that's made out of, is it wood? Yes, I believe so. 
Yeah, it's so cute. And it says social distancing. Um, it says timber, wood, and leather. So that's Joe Timber. Cassandra Ann, is that where the lip bulb came from? I'm not sure where Cassandra Ann fits in. Do you? No? No, I, I thought, I don't know. Wasn't the lip bulb from, I don't know who the lip bulb was. The, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, oh, she said something on the Facebook page. So maybe I can find a clue there. Okay. This will be a whole topic. Yep. This will be a whole topic on its own. <laughs> right. Oh my god. But no, my Bigfoot and the card are already up on my fridge, so that's nice. awesome. So, yeah, that was very sweet. It was just a nice surprise. To, it really you know, was. I wasn't expecting it, so that was really fun. It was great getting something in the mail. Yeah. A little package. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Scroll. <laughs> scroll. Okay. So what did she say? Yeah, they got him. So I wonder if Cassandra is part of the whole... Um, the Bigfoot, the leather and wood shop too. I believe so. Okay, maybe there. I know I've seen her in the Strangers. She, okay, she yeah. Is in yep. the Strangers. Yeah. Sorry, we're completely botching the shout out because we don't know who Cassandra is, but we thank you for whatever part you played in this awesome gift. Yes. Yes, we love them. So thank you so much. Yeah. You know I love anything Bigfoot themed. So. Yeah, you do. Um, housekeeping. Do we have any housekeeping? Oh, we do yeah. have. Uh, we want to mention Brad. Oh yeah, Brad. I'm not sure, hundred percent sure if he wants to say his. Well, let's not say it then. Yeah, I don't know if he wants us to say his last name, so we'll skip it. But he is very active in the Strangers, and he started a new podcast. And the podcast is called Killing, Missing, and Hidden, which is cool. Yep. KMH. Yep. I like that. And I- I found it on Stitcher, so there's looks like there's a lot of really cool topics. So yeah, if yeah I was looking, you're looking for topics. a podcast, check it out. Yeah, it looked like a lot of them kind of tied in with stuff that we have talked about. Yeah. Uh, I haven't listened to the first episode yet. I'm it's downloaded. Once I can get out for walks, I'm gonna start. I need to I need to be better with listening to podcasts. I really do. Cause Me too. Only, I, I only do it on my commute, and I'm not going anywhere. No, so. I only do it on my drive right now because it's been kind of crappy, so I haven't been able to go for a lot of walks. So once I get up and walk in, I need to get out more. I really do. So once I get out and walking, uh, I'll start to listen to more podcasts. So that's on my list to listen to, but I've listened to his preview one about like what it's going to be about, and it sounds like it's going to be really good. Yeah. He's a former criminal defense attorney, so he knows his stuff. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. 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 That's so, really cool. Yeah, so definitely check it out. It is called Killing, Missing, Hidden, and it is by Brad, a stranger, one of our loved strangers. Yeah, and also I wanted to give a quick shout-out to Brian Young. Um, he gave us a shout-out on his latest episode of the – oh, boy, what is the name of the podcast? Uh, it's long historic uh, rambling yes. wait no 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 no. i'm missing something i can't remember i'm a terrible person i have to look in spotify to find this. <laughs> i can't remember um but anyway he and lauren it's historic something ramblings with brian and lauren transatlantic historic history ramblings oh my god i'm botching this too <laughs> with uh brian and lauren yes and the latest episode is about he does an interview with a um, apparently a well-known uh, boxing writer who did a biography of Muhammad Ali. Nice. Um, so I'm listening to that. It's really interesting. I'm not at all into boxing, but I'm still finding it really interesting. But he he gave us a really nice shout out at the beginning and he suggested a really funny what he's calling a podcast wife swap. Where he and I, he and I would do a Bigfoot episode and you and Lauren would do a paranormal, like some kind of paranormal themed episode because she's into the paranormal too. So, and she's a listener. So hi, Lauren. Hi, Brian. I would even let her suggest whatever topic she wants us to cover, but I'd be, I would be up for that. Yeah, we're down. We're down. We can swing. We can be podcast <laughs> swingers. <laughs> In a completely clean and non-perverted way. Yes. <laughs> nice. All right. <laughs> So awesome. Challenge accepted. Very cool. But yeah, I need to listen to more of his podcast too, because I've listened to the first couple, but that's as far as I've got, you know, and I thought not having a job, I would be like, Hey, more time for podcasts. But although I can, Alexa can listen, can play podcasts. So I can lay here on my couch and listen while yeah, I, I have, puts around I have my a, phone. 
I have a Google Mini, and I guess I can do that there too, but I don't know. Technology. <laughs> I'm not figuring that out. <laughs> yeah. But we are not going to do a taste test because it's not cool to do one not in person. So we're going to save our taste tests. Test. We're going to save our taste test stuff until we're together. Sounds good. So I think we're just going to jump right into the main topic. Sweet. And uh, Heather in The Strangers knew. I, I posted a picture of the pink bicycle, and she knew right away what topic we were going to be covering, which really kind of impressed me that she got that right away. Yeah, because I had no idea. <laughs> no, <laughs> even after I told you what the topic was going to be, you still didn't remember. Yeah, until I saw this photo. You sent me another photo today, and that I've seen before, and I kind of have a little idea of the backstory, but I'm I'm excited. This sort of thing really intrigues me. It does, and it's uh, – I've always been – like, I don't want to say tied to the case because that makes it sound like I took part in it, but I've always been, <laughs> like, affected by this because this girl is, like, right around the age I am, you know? Okay. And I remember back when this happened, and there's still new stuff coming out about it, which is, you know, which is really good because I just want there to be some sort of resolution to this. Yeah. About, uh, by now, it's pretty much a given what people think happened, but there's still so many questions involved with this. It's just crazy. It's like another Maura Murray type situation. It really is. Bit. It really like we're is. never going to get closure probably. No. Uh, but most of my stuff came from a podcast. It was put out by a woman named Melinda Esquivel, who was a classmate. Oh, I suppose I should say who it is first. <laughs> uh, the, our main story is about Tara Calico and okay. this is kind of a well-known case especially like you can mention her name and people won't really know until they see the fo the Polaroid and they're mm -hmm. like oh yeah like I was by my friend Aaron's house the other day and I showed him the picture and he knew exactly what it was and he knew about the case and stuff so it is about Tara Calico it is Tara it's not Tara but I'm probably going to end up screwing it up because Tara always makes me think of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So I'm probably always going to say Tara. <laughs> so I'll try to I'll try to be good with Tara. But her name was Tara Calico. And the podcast was put out by a woman named Melinda Esquibel. And she was actually a classmate of Tara's, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. And she started a podcast called Vanished, the Tara Calico Investigation. And that's where a lot of this stuff came from. If you are, are at all interested in this case, definitely check out that podcast because it is really good. It's really well done. And you learn a lot from it. So, story of Tara Calico. Tara Calico was born on February 28th, 1969. So she was just a little bit older than I am. You know, so I've always felt, like, tied to this. Yeah. She lived in Bellin, New Mexico with her mother, Patty, and her stepfather, John. Tara was a smart, extremely responsible, athletic, genuinely sweet person, and she was studying psychology at the Valencia branch of the University of New Mexico. On September 20th, 1988, that is also my brother Corey's birthday, so I always mm. remember that, that that's what day, you know, he was born in 74, not in 88, but I always remember that this happened on his birthday. On September 20th, 1988, 19-year-old Tara left her Bellin, New Mexico home to take a bike ride like she did almost every day. She had left for the bike ride around 9.30 a.m. that morning, asking her mother to come find her if she wasn't home by noon because she had a tennis date with her boyfriend that afternoon and she had been having trouble with her bike tires going flat. Her mother agreed and said goodbye, not knowing that that would be the last time she would ever see her daughter. When Tara wasn't home by noon, her mom got into her car and headed out to find her. Tara's usual route was pretty lengthy, spanning 36 miles along New Mexico State Road 47. 36-mile bike ride is a pretty good lengthy bike ride. Yeah. You know, and she used to do this almost every day. She was very athletic. Tara's mom had often made the bike trip with her, but she had been doing it less and less after a recent incident where a car passed really close by her and it seemed to her like the driver had continually passed them several times, watching them each time. That's creepy. Mm -hmm. Tara's mother suggested that Tara might want to bring pepper spray, but Tara shrugged off the suggestion. 
When Tara couldn't be found along the route, her mother started to panic and called the police. A search party was put together that, along with the police, traveled the entire road to look for any sign of what had happened to Tara. Along the route, I keep saying, I keep switching between route and route. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to stick with one of those, too. Along the route, Tara's broken Walkman and a cassette tape were found, along with what looked like bike tracks that could have possibly been from her bike tires. And there are some conflicting reports that there was a broken bicycle reflector found in the same area. Uh, one of the things that I always remember that I, I read years and years ago is that the tape she had been listening to was the album Third Stage by the band Boston. And I love that album. So that's another thing that kind of like, you still, know, any, yeah. yes, any, I still listen to that album a lot. And anytime I do, it makes me think of this case because that was what they found in the broke with the broken Walkman that was laying on the road. There was no sign of the neon pink huffy mountain bike that Tara had been riding. So she was just gone. All that they found was her Walkman, her broken Walkman, the cassette tape, and possibly a broken reflector off of her bicycle. Okay. The police asked if anyone had been out driving that day and if they had seen anyone suspicious. Nobody had seemed to see anything out of the ordinary, but a few people did say that they remember seeing Tara riding back towards her home around 11.45 a.m. still wearing her Walkman. Multiple witnesses report seeing an older model, light-colored pickup truck, trailing slowly behind her that may have been pulling a shell camper. The police began to suspect that Tara had decided to run away from home, but her parents and her friends strongly denied that that was even a possibility. I mean, she had a very happy home life. Uh, she was very happy with her boyfriend. She had no reasons to run away from home. You know, but that is always one of the first things that the mm -hmm. police always suggest. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the family continued to search and hope for some sign of what had happened to Tara, but nothing came up. They were just, there was nothing they were left with. And again, I cannot imagine that feeling. You know, your daughter vanished and... There's nothing. There's no sign of anything. So I just feel like that's just so sad. Yeah, I think that's got to be the one. One of the worst things that could happen to someone you love is they just disappear without a trace. Yeah, and all you, you have, never know. You never no. know what happened. All you have is her busted Walkman and a cassette tape that she had been listening to at the time. Right. All manner of horrible things would go through your mind, and you have no way of knowing no. what happened. No. <clears throat> Then, on June 15, 1989, nine months after her disappearance, in Port St. Joe, Florida, which was 1,500 miles away from where Tara disappeared, a woman found a Polaroid photo laying in the parking lot of a convenience store. And this is going to be posted in the group. I'm sure most of you listening have seen the photo. It's been on Unsolved Mysteries. It's been on true crime shows, etc. But it'll be posted in The Strangers. The photo shows a young woman and a young boy with tape over their mouths and their arms behind their backs laying in the back of a van looking at the camera. It's a really disturbing photo. It is. I mean, that's why anybody that sees this photo remembers it, because it's it's just bizarre and disturbing. Yeah. The woman who found the photo immediately called the police and told them that a white windowless Toyota cargo van was parked there when she had walked into the store and she described the van's driver as a man with a mustache who appeared to be in his 30s. The police set up roadblocks, but the van was never found. The Polaroid was analyzed, and the photo was said to have been taken after May 1989 because it was a new type of film that had just been put out on the market. So it was a relatively new photo. No real headway was made with the photo after that, but then the following month, the Polaroid was shown on the television show A Current Affair. And I think I may have even seen A Current Affair when the Polaroid was on there, because I remember seeing stuff about the Polaroid shortly after it was found. <laughs> Friends of Tara's family that happened to see the television show contacted Tara's mom, Patty, thinking that the girl in the photo looked a lot like Tara. Patty looked at the photo and wasn't sure at first, but the more she looked at it, the more she became convinced that the girl in the Polaroid was Tara. She said that the girl in the photo seemed to have a scar on her leg in the same exact place that Tara had one, and that the book lying next to the girl in the photo, which is the book My Sweet Audrina by V.C. Andrews, was Tara's favorite book. Hmm. They then had the photo sent out, 
and it came back with really mixed verdicts. Experts at the Los Alamos National Laboratory said that they concluded that the girl in the photo wasn't Tara, but Scotland Yard said that they believe it was Tara, and the <laughs> FBI said they couldn't figure it out either way. So, you know, it's kind of... So yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, FBI said, I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, well, what's interesting is I, I'm kind of looking at photos, and there's a lot of comparison photos of, like, yeah. pro- the eyebrows are different. Yes. You know, yes. the shape of the eyebrows, the ridge of the nose is different, and those are actually really telltale things. Yes, they are. They are. And and we'll get into that later. Okay. <laughs> Hey, I did it again. <laughs> that's, that's one for our bingo, our strange sessions bingo. Yep. <laughs> and uh, the family of Michael Henley, a nine-year-old boy who disappeared in New Mexico in May of 1988, also saw the episode of A Current Affair and felt that the boy in the photo greatly resembled Michael. But then in 1990, Michael Henley's remains were discovered in the mountains of New Mexico, seven miles from the campsite he disappeared from. The coroner determined that he had died of exposure, so the boy in the photo turned out not to be Michael Henley. But his parents were convinced that that was him, and that's something that you have to wonder if it plays into Tara's mom believing that that's Tara in the photo, is that you so badly want her to be alive that you want that to be her in the photo, as disturbing as it is, the idea that that is her in the photo it's still that she's alive, you know, so that might play into it. And then that was pretty much it for almost 20 years. Nothing came out. People had this photo and Tara's disappearance, and that was it. Then in 2008, a Valencia County sheriff named Rene Rivera, who joined the department the year after Tara vanished, said in an article for the Valencia County News Bulletin, that he had learned that two men, who at the time were teenagers who knew Tara, were driving behind her that day and accidentally hit her bike. Mm -hmm. He said that they panicked, drove off with the dead girl, and buried her, or that they had injured her badly and ended up killing her and burying her. He said that they believed two other men had knowledge as to where the body was buried, with the boys' families even helping them cover up the accident. Mm -hmm. But because there wasn't any solid evidence, they couldn't do anything about it. Rivera stated in an interview, quote, The individuals who did the harm to Tara knew who she was. They knew who she was, and they're all local individuals. And I believe that their parents were some of the people that helped the individuals with hiding the truth or hiding the body and trying to escape prosecution. Tara's dad, John, was understandably pissed, saying, quote, There's such a thing as circumstantial evidence, and I know in other places they've gotten a conviction on strong circumstantial evidence. So, you know, he basically came out and said this, but nothing could be done about it. Hmm. I mean, it definitely seems plausible. I think things like this happen all the time, you know. It totally does, but the idea of somebody's parents helping them dispose of a body, just, I don't know. I can see it happening. I can totally see your kids are young. I would not, obviously I feel like I have good enough morals that I would never do this, No, I w- <laughs> but I know that I know there are parents out there who, who would rather help their kids quote, you know, pardon the pun, bury something like this yeah. rather than see them go to jail. Yeah. I get, I don't know. I just have a hard, I know what happens and I, I understand, but I just have a hard time wrapping my mind around that. Well, yeah, it's messed up. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. And yeah. especially if it was an accident, why would you go through the trouble of covering it up if it was just an accident? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, we'll get, we'll get into that when we talk about what we think. Okay. Then in 2009, that, I need a drink. Hang on. Okay. Oh, hi, Narnie. <laughs> <laughs> You heard that? I did. It was so cute. <laughs> hey, Narnia. Hey. No, now she's not doing she it. She doesn't talk on command, of no, course. No, she doesn't. <laughs> that was so cute. You should leave that in there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I will. Then they could hear Narnia. She mm-hmm. just, she still wonders what the hell I'm doing. Yeah, Lucy too. Oh, okay. Actually, she's sleeping in the next room, so she's leaving me in al- alone right now. Yeah. Narnia is like, she jumped up on the chair. She's like laying right by my arm now. Just staring at me, trying to figure out what I'm doing. (laughs) Then, in 2009, 
Port St. Joe Police Chief David Barnes was mailed a photograph of a young boy with black marker drawn completely over his mouth, making it look like the boy in the 1989 photo. That's just weird. Yeah, I see it. I can see the photo. Barnes was then mailed a second letter containing the original unaltered image of the boy. The Star newspaper in Port St. Joe also received the photo of the boy with marker over his mouth. At the same time, a psychic called and reported having visions of the case, saying that Tara was buried in California and described a blue Oldsmobile car. Authorities dismissed her account, but thought that the timing was really weird that the psychic called like the same time that somebody sent a picture of the boy with black marker drawn over his mouth to make it look mm-hmm. like the one in the photo, which is just yeah. kind of bizarre. Then, in 2013, a man named Henry Brown made a deathbed confession. He told the police that his neighbor, Lawrence Romero Jr., and several of his friends discussed killing Tara on the day that she went missing. Romero's father was the Valencia County Sheriff at the time of Tara's disappearance. Hmm. Yeah, so that is the... Is she purring right now? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, I swear I can hear her purring. Well, Maybe. that's interesting because I think deathbed confessions are something you shouldn't just scoff at, you know? No, you should not take it lightly. No. Yeah, but he he said that several of his friends talked about killing Tara on the day that she disappeared and that uh, one, of the, one of the people that did this, his father was the county sheriff, the Valencia County Sheriff at the time of the disappearance. So that's kind of interesting. So, yeah, according to what this person said, one of the people that was responsible for her death, uh, his dad was the sheriff. So, Hmm. you know, what better person to help you cover up evidence and cover it up? And when if you listen to the podcast that I mentioned, there's a lot of. uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Evidence. There's a lot of evidence that kind of strangely went missing. You mm. know, people's reports and stuff like that. So, I don't know. I don't know what I well, think that... And I could understand the neighbor's hesitancy. The guy who made the deathbed confession, confession, I could understand his hesitancy to say anything knowing that this person's dad was in yeah. law enforcement. You know, you just don't know which way it's going to go. No, exactly. You Either they're going to cover it up or you're going to end up dead. You're or end up missing. Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. I mean, I hate to think that way about law enforcement, but because most law enforcement people are wonderful and I don't know what we do without them, but there are bad seeds in every. Oh, and if this person was responsible for bearing evidence and getting rid of evidence and stuff, who's to say that they wouldn't get rid of you? Get rid of you. <laughs> right. Exactly. All right, end of episode. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm trying to figure out where I was here. Okay. <laughs> so then, uh, two other Polaroid photographs that were said to have been thought to maybe be of Tara Calico have turned up over the years. One is a blurry photo of a girl's face with tape covering her mouth. Uh, I don't want to post that in the group because there's nudity in it. But... You know, I just saw that too, and it looks photoshopped to me. Oh. It looks like someone's face was photoshopped on someone else's body because the color is so different and yes. the clarity. But the, it's a bad photo to start with. I mean, it's, it it's blurry and you can't really tell. And a lot of people don't think that's her. Uh, and another one, I don't know if you came across this one. Oh, wait. Uh, a blurry photo of a girl's face with tape covering her mouth. This photo was found near a construction site in California. Forensic research on the photo says that it was taken sometime after May of 1989. Tara's mother believes that it could possibly be Tara in the photo, but a lot of people don't think it is, and I don't Mm. think it is either. Well, and if it was a physical photo that was found, then it wasn't photoshopped, obviously. Yeah, yeah, but who's to say that that's the actual photo, too? Right. And the second... That's disturbing, though. The second possible Polaroid is a photo of a loosely bound woman with her eyes covered sitting next to a man on an Amtrak train dated sometime around February of 1990. And for the longest time, people were like, I want to see this photo. I want to see this photo. I want to see this photo. Is this her? And then the photo was released, and it is the dumbest looking photo. It's seriously... It kind of is. Yeah, You can see that the girl's like tied loosely with like toilet paper. Yeah. And the guy next to her has this dumb look on his face. You know, it's obvious that this was like a joke photograph set up. 
that people somehow tied in with Tara Calico. I don't know. Yeah, because it doesn't look like her. But when I saw that the photo was finally released, I went and looked at it, and I was like, oh. And that's what everybody's <laughs> response was. They're like, that was a waste of time. Right. You know, because that is not her. <laughs> that's, it's not very believable. No, it's not a yeah. believable photo at all. So, but these Polaroids, you know, showed up. So seriously, people, stop taking creepy Polaroid photos. Because it's just <laughs> right? not Of cool. people with their mouths covered up. Yeah. I mean, that's just yeah. creepy. Yes, it is. After seeing the 2008 article where the sheriff in Valencia County stated that, quote, he knew the boys, now men that committed the crime and the parents that helped cover it up, a high school classmate of Tara named Melinda Esquivel started a podcast called Banish, the Tara Calico Investigation, hoping to bring the case back into the public eye. Uh, the podcast led to a lot of interviews and new leads, such as the fact that Tara was seen on her bike ride that died that day by at least 13 witnesses, hmm. four of them being a group of hunters who said that they saw a 1956 Ford pickup with a camper shell following Tara while the driver was looking, quote, intently at her, which is hmm. creepy. Yeah. And on the podcast, she interviews one of the hunters. Uh, the sound quality of the interview is horrible, but she does play the, the interview with the hunter. So it was kind of a surprise to people that at least 13 witnesses saw her that day because people didn't realize that. Yeah. Now, the truck that they describe is different than the truck that was described earlier, though, right? There's a, there's a couple different descriptions of this truck that people saw following her. So, okay. But you don't know. I mean, I was thinking about this yesterday when I drove to the grocery store. I was going down a country road and... There was a lady walking her dog, and I kind of just glanced at her when I passed her. But then down the road, I was listening to this podcast, actually. And I'm thinking, God, if that woman disappeared, would You'd I, be a suspect. Would I re but at the well, that, plus would <laughs> I remember anything? I was like right. trying to think, like, what color was the leash? What she, was she wearing? And I didn't remember, and I had just passed her. Mm. You know, so it's like a lot of these people that, that witnessed her were hypnotized. And gave some accounts, and, you know, they hypnotized them in order to see if they would remember anything else. So mm -hmm. they gave some accounts, but there are a lot of accounts of people seeing some kind of pickup truck, like, trailing slowly behind her. Yeah. You know what they say about, like, well, oh, you I just know. demonstrated. I the eyewitness testimony yeah, is so exactly. unreliable. It is. The podcast also mentions an anonymous witness who saw the truck and saw two men sitting in it. She gave her statement to the police and even picked the two men out of a photo lineup. One of the men was Lawrence Romero Jr., the son of the Valencia County Sheriff at the time that Tara disappeared, and one of the people believed to be involved in the case. So that was interesting that mm -hmm. she picked out the sheriff's son. Yeah, that is interesting. Yes. But his that son... That can't be a coincidence. No, exactly. His son, Romero Jr., died supposedly while playing a game of Russian roulette. <laughs> I know. That's, okay. I'm, I'm not that bored yet in quarantine that I'm contemplating <laughs> right. playing that, but... My God. Yeah, once I read that, it was like, wow. So, yeah, uh, the, he, the one that they believed was involved, the sheriff's son, is dead. Hmm. Okay. Yep. And then, Strange coincidence. Then, the podcast also talked more about the man named Henry Brown, the man who did the deathbed confession. According to the website, The Y Culture... In an article called Terra Calico, A Case of Mysterious Disappearance, the article goes on to say, quote, Henry Brown, who was on his deathbed, requested to speak to Deputy Frank Mathola. He told him that back in the day, he used to spend time with a small group of boys that included Lawrence Romero Jr., the sheriff's son, hanging out in a makeshift basement beneath a trailer. While they were in there one time, he noticed something covered in a tarp that he believed was a small body. The other boys began talking about Tara and how they killed her. There he learned that the sheriff's son had a crush on her and that he knew that she would be on Highway 47 that morning. He went on to say that the boys hit her with a truck, brought her back to the trailer, raped her, and then proceeded to kill her to keep her from telling anyone. Brown said that Romero Jr. sold drugs and that he was being protected by his father. He had also heard him say that Rivera would look out for them because his father had hired him. I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. Brown informed them that they later moved the body to a pond and they took the bike to a junkyard. However, while doing her own research, Melinda Esquivel didn't find any documentation or any other recordings of this correspondence. 
So the one who gave the deathbed confession said that uh, they they hit her on her bike and they raped her and then killed her and disposed of the body. Hmm. Mathola had interviewed a local cattleman named Ron Chavez inquiring about ponds in the area. And Chavez told him that while Sheriff Rivera was investigating Romero Jr.'s death, he had found a suicide note confessing to Tara Calico's murder, which somehow was never submitted into evidence. And soon after finding that out, Mathola was reassigned in the department. So that's, <laughs> that's a little sketchy. Uh, totally. Tara's biological father died in 2002, and her mother, Patty, passed away in 2006, never giving up hope that her daughter was still alive. That's so sad. It is. So that's basically what we have. And there are three main questions about this case, and there's theories for each. So main question number one about the case, what happened to Tara Calico on the day she vanished? Uh, theory A, she ran away from home. And I don't think that's likely at all. I really don't. <laughs> You know, did she take her bike with her if she ran away from home? Why? I just, I think that's not even an option because I, I cannot believe she would never have gotten in touch with her family after all this coverage on, on the news about this case. Why would she tell her mom, if I'm not home by noon, come exactly. looking for me? Why would exactly. you, that would be like taunting her if you weren't planning on coming home. Exactly. So I think, I think theory A is... Nah, I don't not like it. E nope, not even an option. Nope. Yeah. Theory B, she was accidentally hit and disposed of. You know. Like I mean, I could they, definitely they, see that happening. And one of the things that I think points to this, even though I cannot get concrete evidence that this was an actual thing, was the broken bicycle reflector. You know, it's mm -hmm. very possible someone accidentally hit her on the road, panicked, took her and her bike, and disposed of her. Right. You know, but but then of that just goes to. I I can't get in the mindset of somebody who does something like this, hits somebody, and takes them to dispose of them, and then finds out that they aren't dead. No, right? Know, are you gonna kill that person? I just right. cannot. I cannot. Now you're a full fledged murderer yeah, at I that. Cannot, point. I cannot fathom that. I can. No. I don't. I don't know. I think the knee jerk reaction would be like, oh my god, they're still alive, and then take them to a hospital. But I, uh, you and I. Like you said, with the morals, I could never in a million yeah. years do this. But Dude, I, I cry at commercials. <laughs> I do, too. I, do too. I just can't even imagine I do too. I am trying gonna... to cover. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, it. well, I think it's possible that she was accidentally hit and disposed of. I'm hoping that if that is the case, she was killed immediately. Yeah, didn't suffer you know? at all. But I, I do think that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, theory C, she was intentionally stalked, probably raped, and killed. And I, I think that's a very likely possibility, too. Yeah. You know. Do you think the Polaroid is her? We'll get to that. That's, enough. that's okay. one of the other questions that we're going to discuss. But okay. I, could, I could see the guy's deathbed confession about the sheriff's daughter, or the sheriff's son, purposely following her hitting her on her bike and then raping her and killing her. I could, I don't want to believe that that's what happened because that's horrible. Right. right. But I could see that being a possibility. I really could. Well, and why would he make a deathbed confession like that if it weren't true? And there seems to be circumstantial evidence that supports it. Oh, totally. There, there seems to be a lot of evidence, you know, and if the bike reflector was there, it's just more sign that she was hit, mm -hmm. you know, and people, yeah. people did see this truck following her. And, and one of the people, out of the lineup picked out the sheriff's son as being in the truck. So I think that's very, I think it's a likely possibility. I really do. Was that truck itself ever traced back to I anyone? I don't believe so. I don't like believe nobody it owned a truck that looked like that. That I, was a suspect. I don't believe so. I, okay. At least I didn't hear that in the podcast anywhere. And finally, theory D, she was kidnapped and trafficked. And that was one that her mom really kind of, was her mom's main theory and her mom believed that the walkman and the tape being left behind were tara trying to leave a trail of where she was being taken hmm. i just don't well i don't know about that i i think it's more likely she dropped it in a struggle or something like that but yeah 
Yeah, I mean, I... Because that I, doesn't really tell you anything. No, <laughs> Those exactly. things lying on the ground exactly. aren't really clues. So, I don't think she was kidnapped and trafficked. It's a possibility, I guess, but I don't think that's one of the more likely possibilities. Right. So then we get to main question number two. Is the girl in the Polaroid photo Tara? And the two theories for this, of course, theory A, she is the girl in the photo. And the the thing with the scar, because the website for the podcast that I mentioned has the best copy of the Polaroid photo that I've ever seen. I was looking specifically for like the highest resolution copy, the best copy of the photo, and that website had the best copy. And looking at the photo, you can see what looks like a scar on the girl's mm-hmm. leg. Yeah, and, I see that. And her mom says that she had a scar in the same exact place. I wish there was a photo of her alive that where you could see her leg and you could see the scar so you mm-hmm. could match it up. But the scar to me has always been an interesting thing that makes me wonder if that is her. And of course there's the book that's next to yeah. her, her, her favorite. That's what I was going to say is the book. It would be a really bizarre coincidence. It is, but you know, that brings us to theory B. She isn't the girl in a photo. Uh, and like you said earlier, her eyebrows look different. Mm-hmm. Her nose looks different. Like her, where her nose falls between her eyes looks different. Yeah. That's, I mean, she does have a resemblance to the to Tara. She really does. Oh, I totally see a resemblance, especially. But, and then the there's the scar too. So it's just, I don't know. I don't know. But then somebody, somebody on a, a subreddit about the case said this quote, which I really agree with they said quote attaching significance to a vc andrews book being in the shot with a teen girl in the late 80s it's like <laughs> it's like attaching significance to a twilight novel being in a shot with a girl in 2008 they were it's everywhere true. at the time and that's true i remember back then everybody reading these vc andrews books so the fact that that's in the photo doesn't necessarily point to that being tara well and those books were a little risque, I, I did to not, say the least. I did not know what those books were about. Mm-hmm. But then one of the things I read about this case talked about how some of the stuff in the book kind of reflected what was going on in this case. So right, I, I could I, see the kidnapper being yeah. obsessed with a book like yeah. that. So then I was looking at the Wikipedia, uh, reading the story, and I'm like, these books are freaking... They're messed up. They're really <laughs> they're messed, a little messed up. up. And they were like people like in 6th, 7th grade reading these books. Yeah. Reading about I, I, theft and whatnot. I had no idea that these were that, like that. I, I never opened these books, so I never knew. And I was like, wow, these were really sketchy, <laughs> sketchy yeah. books. Yeah. But I totally agree with this guy that back then, seeing that book there, any teen girl at that time might have had that book. You know, so right. that doesn't necessarily point to her being Tara. Right. So it's, very, it's a good observation for yeah, sure. Yeah. So that is question number two. And finally, big question. Well, I have a quick question, yes. actually. How long ago, how long between her disappearance and when this Polaroid was found had passed? Nine months. Oh, okay. Because clearly the girl in the Polaroid, um, her face is so much skinnier. But yeah. if she had been deprived of food or, you know, yes. she easily could have yes. lost that amount of weight in that yes. amount of time. Okay. But I don't think that would affect your eyebrows or your no, eye, where, no. your, where your nose lies between your eyes. Right. You eyebrows know? can be eyebrows can be tweezed, you know, to be shaped a certain yes. way. Yes. But you, people who have straight eyebrows, it's pretty distinct. And the girl in the photo has straight eyebrows and hers had a very distinct soft curve to them. T- yes. Tara's did. Yes. So, yeah. But I, yeah, I'll get to that into what do you think. Uh, but then finally, big question number three, what is the story behind the Polaroid photo? And there are two main theories about this. Theory A, it's real. There's a, there's, And this is one you're going to see people argue back and forth a lot is whether it's real or whether it's staged. Mm-hmm. So people that say it's real say that... Uh, in front of the boy, and I did not notice this until I saw a better resolution photo of the, the Polaroid. In front of the boy, there's another piece of duct tape that looks like it has vomit on it. And oh, I, mean, I see that's, that. That's, 
but this is a, a case where I would love to see this original photo. Right. Know, because Tara's mom, there what said that there was on the spine of the book, there's a, it's written really small is a phone number. And you can't see it in any reproductions of the Polaroid, but you can see it on the actual Polaroid. Mm. And they tried figuring out what the phone number was, tried calling all these numbers to no, to no luck. So I feel like there's so much more in the actual photo that we're not seeing. Mm -hmm. But they said that in the actual photo, you can see that that piece, uh, that thing in front of the boys, laying in front of the boy's face is a piece of duct tape that looks like it has vomit on it, which leads to it not being a staged photo. I can see the duct tape. I can't see the vomit. No, exactly. I will People, say, though, the look on his face. And that's what I was going to say is that. genuinely looks scared. Up until this week, my opinion was that it was a staged photo. But mm -hmm. then when I saw the better resolution photo and, and looked at him, he looks genuinely frightened. Mm -hmm. And the girl. She looks, looks kind of dazed. She looks dazed, but she also looks like defiant. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. like she's angry at whoever is taking the picture. It also, the impression I get is that she's squinting at the light because she's probably been shut up in this ba band for a while. You know what okay. I mean? The Somebody... I was Go getting ahead. was that she's squinting like, I hate you. Yes, that's, that's the impression that I was getting. Probably both. Yeah, but up until I looked at the better quality photo, I thought it was staged. But seeing the look on the boy's face, that looks like fear. That 100% looks yeah. like fear. I have a, you know, the things that come to mind are, is the, the people who believe this is their son, did he have a shirt that looked like that? Did Tara have a shirt that looked like that, that her parents could remember I, you know? I don't believe so but I, they think that the kidnapper or whoever might have bought that for her to wear you know, yeah i probably. don't know they know what shirt that is somebody figured out what shirt that is i have it on my i have it saved right here on my desktop actually it is a t-shirt from i guess it's a software company it's called egghead egghead software that's the t-shirt that she's wearing in the photo okay. so they managed to figure that out and another thing I didn't notice until I saw people mention it, but once I saw the better quality photo from the podcast website, there's down by the boy's leg, there's a cup and underneath the cup, you can see what looks like a gun, like a, people said it's a squirt gun, but I could finally see the gun that's like, looks like it's laying under oh, yeah. the cup. So yep. I never saw that before. So now I know where that is. Yeah. It's kind of under her legs. Yeah. But yeah. that's in the okay. photo too. But uh, that that's as far as it being real those are the, the things that there's the duct tape that looks like it has vomit on it but and if if you're doing a stage photo are you going to take the duct tape off and put another piece on you know that's mm -hmm. that's kind of swayed me to think that it's an actual photo of actual kidnapped people right and, and seeing the look on the boy's face is just frightening but then the theory b people say that it's a staged photo and People point to the fact that, especially the girl, she people said she looks like what you would look like if somebody's telling you to pretend to have your hands tied behind your back. People have analyzed this and said that based on where her hands are and the way her arms are, that they don't think that her hands are really like mm -hmm. tied or handcuffed behind her back. You can see a couple of her fingers sticking out from underneath her her butt, I guess you could say, if you look. I see what looks like maybe a thumb and a finger poking out underneath her. I don't know what that means, but I don't know if you can see that. I have never noticed that. I'm looking right now. Oh, that's what that is. I could never figure out mm -hmm. what that is. Okay. That's actually, that actually makes a lot of sense. Okay. And then that's maybe what they were figuring is that, that they think that her hand wouldn't be in that position if her hands were clasped behind her back tied. Yeah, because if they, well, depending on how they were tied, that'd be a really, it'd be really hard yeah. to get your fingers to stick out that way. Yeah, it would. Because generally your hands are tied, you know, palms facing each other. Yeah. And I don't know how you would, yeah, it, it doesn't seem like, I can see what they're saying. She looks almost comfortable, and I imagine you'd be really straining and uncomfortable if your hands were tied together that way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and another thing that people point at to it being staged is that the girl's legs appear to be shaved, hmm. you know, and they're saying if she was kidnapped and bound and gagged, uh, shouldn't she have hairy legs, basically? 
Unless her kidnappers and uh Well, unless he's you never letting, know. <laughs> unless he's letting them, you know, like live their normal life unless they're out in the van. I don't know. Yeah. I don't I know. Don't but know. would you if you were a kidnapper, would you give a girl a razor blade? I don't know. Or or they're doing it for her, you know. Yeah. People are weird. People are really know. weird. Yes, they are. But I don't know. I mean that is a good point mm-hmm. that you have to look at. <laughs> Although she may just have really light hair that you can't see. That's very true too. That's very true too. But that's one of the that's one of the top things that people say about it being a staged photo. Mm. And people have brought up that when you're duct taped over your mouth like that for a lengthy amount of time, you have red like red lines of irritation around where the duct tape is. And they say that you can't see that in the photo. Like in the good photo, in the original photo, there's no irritation there. Like they've been duct taped for quite a while. Well, and something Jim always points out when we watch stuff like, you know, people getting kidnapped and putting duct tape over your mouth, just stick your tongue between your lips and start wetting the duct tape. Eventually it's going to come off. I mean, duct tape's actually not the greatest tape in the world. It's actually horrible for duct work. Um, but moisture, I could see how you could easily get duct tape off. That is a good life tip. I did not know that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I hope I never get duct tape on my mouth. because that Me would too. But... Well, me too. And I have a hard time breathing through my nose. <laughs> that would be a problem. Okay. Don't ever kidnap Chris to anybody. Please. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Just in general. But the fact that that irritation isn't there shows that they're not, it's not a, like a constant thing. But right, again, it could have just maybe, been for this photo. I yeah, don't know. Maybe the person doesn't have them duct tape when they're in his house. I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, and the last thing about that is that, according to the podcast, there are reports that a call was made several years later by a woman who said she was the girl in the photo but all of this stuff was stored on an investigator's computer that crashed and they lost all the stuff that was on the computer. So they don't remember the girl's name and they don't have any of the things that she said. But there, there is a girl that called years later that said hmm. she is the girl that was in the photo. That's strange. That is strange. So that's basically. Did she give an explanation? I don't know. It didn't say in the podcast. Hmm. That's but that's basically it. So what do you think? <laughs> I know. I'm I know. on information overload. Yeah, there's a I'm lot. Not, I'm not sure I buy that she's Tara, that the girl in the Polaroid is Tara. I just don't, you know, I don't see enough support for that. Um, especially with the facial. I think what's frustrating is that, to, you know, some well known agencies who deal with things like this gave conflicting responses. So yes. yeah. that's annoying. Yes. Um, I wonder if they analyzed this now. They would come up with, you know, facial recognition software has probably come a very long way. Yes. Maybe this well, should be reanalyzed. I don't even know. If you do a Google search on this photo, there's a lot of people that have photoshopped, like, yeah. the girl without the the duct tape on her face, what mm-hmm. she would look like. Yep. I saw that, too. Yeah. So, first of all, what do you, <sighs> think, what do you think happened to Tara Calico? I think the deathbed confession has the most weight to it, personally. I, I agree, too. I, I do think that she was intentionally stalked and she was either grabbed off of her bike or her bike was hit and when she was laying on the road they took her i i I hate that that's like my least favorite right possibility but i do think that that's what happened i really do right because you know she suffered at that point i don't want to say that i don't want to believe that the sheriff helped cover up her death but but maybe he didn't know about it he had to if he if they were purposely losing evidence that pointed to his son being Yeah, there. that's true. Yeah. But I I do think that that is I could see it being an accidental hit and run also. You know, but mm-hmm. like the, the question's always been where what happened to the bike? There was never any trace found of the bike. You know, but I yeah. do agree with you. I think the most likely theory is that she was intentionally stalked probably by the sheriff's son hit, hit, raped, and killed. Right. I really think so. And then that would point to that not being Tara in the photo. Yep. And then what do you think about question two? Is she the girl in the photo? I say no. Even even without the deathbed confession, I still don't. I think there's some coincidences. 
I, I've got a scar on my leg. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just, I don't think that we don't have anything to compare it to. That book is super popular at that time. And a couple of the facial comparison photos I'm seeing lead me to think it's not her. Yeah. I see a resemblance and I understand why her parents would be desperate to think she was still alive. But I just don't think it's her. I don't think it's her either. I, Which I, is really I, freaky. Like, who is it then? Exactly. <laughs> and what I, happened I, to I her? I just don't think it's her. I, the, the eyebrows and the, the nose kind yeah. of points to me that it's not her. But wow. I mean, it looks like her. It does. But also, if it was her, why is this photo in Florida when she was taken from New Mexico? But that then that points towards that she was being trafficked outside the country. Right. You know, so I guess that's a possibility. But my opinion is that that's not Tara in the photo. Right. I agree. And then lastly, question number three, what is the story behind the Polaroid photo? Do you think it's real or do you think it's staged? I feel like it's real. Yeah. It just evokes this feeling of like, like a sick feeling in my stomach when I look at it. Not like the woman on the Amtrak train. No. That to me is like, what the? it just looks like a joke. It looks yeah. like they're joking around. Yeah. This photo has a totally different feel to it. I feel like it's real. What the story is behind it, I have no clue. No, yeah, if it's staged, I could see some dad being on a trip with his kids being, oh, let's take a funny picture. Well, that's I'll, I'll show this. Well, I could, I'll say it's, this is one way to deal with your kids on a long distance trip. Sure. You know, just for a joke photo. But <laughs> but I don't know. I The fear on the boys in the boys' eyes. I think if this were a joke, the people who did it would have would admitted have, to a yes, binary. because this was a this was seen this photo has been seen a lot, and it's been shown in a lot of stories. Especially knowing that parents of missing people are desperate to believe it's their kids. At that point, you'd be like, ah, okay, I admit it, it was me. But maybe that's what this this woman who called in and said that was me in the photo was calling in for to say no, it was just a joke photo that we made. Yeah. You know. But, I guess she'll, you know, provide follow-up evidence then. Submit a yeah. picture of what you looked like at that time so we can yeah. compare it. So up until this week, like I said, I was convinced that the photo was staged. But after seeing, a, like, a better photo, I think that it is real. I think it is two children that were abducted from somewhere. I yeah. really do. And maybe it was in Florida that they were trafficked out of Florida. I don't know. Well, and the girl calling and saying it was her, I don't, I don't really put a lot of significance to that oh, no, because, because you know how calling. many yes yeah who false. admit to crimes they didn't commit yes, because they just want to insert themselves in the investigation you know yes yep so i could totally see that too but yeah up until this week i thought it was staged but now after seeing more of it and learning more about it i think it's real i think it's a real photo of an abduction i really yeah do. yeah which is so, disturbing it is i don't ever want to find the woman that found that photo i guess just regret so much finding that photo because you know she's been investigated and doxxed mm. and she just wishes she never would have found that photo right yeah you know but you so. opened a can of worms that nobody can ever close because it just has it left everybody with more questions than exactly answers, exactly so. so there you go that is the mm. story of tara calico it's one that i've always been very attached to and I hope that there's a resolution to this one day. But at this point, I just don't think there's going to be unless right. they find her, uh, her remains somewhere. I right. Don't it's just and a, a little. Yeah. It's yeah, it a, is sad. It's a sad story all around. You don't know what became of the kids in the photograph. You don't know what became of Tara. Are her parents deceased now, too? Yes. Her mom died, yeah. I believe, in 2006. And her father died. Um. Um, 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 her father died in 2002 and her mother passed away in 2006. And well, I guess she... one way to look at it, though, is now they know. Yeah. They know yes. what happened now and they're yeah. probably with her. So, yeah, but if it you was, believe in that sort of thing. It was hard listening to, uh, like, uh, the woman that did the podcast, um, Melinda Esquibel, put out messages to her family and said, I understand if you guys don't want to talk about it, but if you would like to be interviewed, you know, for the podcast, call me back and we'll discuss it. And they had, uh, I believe her stepsister or her half sister okay. on there. And it was, that one was tough. Cause she, you know, started crying 
talking about what was going on. And that was just, yeah. like, that was a hard one to get through, you know, cause she talked about what all went on that day and all that stuff. So that was just like really tough to get through. Yeah. I can imagine. So I wish there would be some resolution to it, but I just don't think there's going to be. So just all okay. around a really scary and sad case. Yeah, absolutely. So there you go. Well, that was depressing. <laughs> it was really depressing. But we got a very nice voicemail from one of our most beloved listeners, Dash. Yes. So did you listen to it yet? No. Should I do that now? <laughs> do that now, and then we'll edit it into the episode. So here is Dash's voicemail he left for us. Kurt and Krista, we're so glad to hear that new episode today and hear that you're both doing well. This is Dash, by the way. But I want to say that it sounded great and that you can't just tease us with a tasty little podcast nugget like that and not give us a full episode. So we hope to hear more very, very soon. Talk to you later, guys. Bye. Well, that was very nice. It's it's funny how, like, as he's talking, he's like, this is Dash, by the way. And it's weird that I actually recognized his voice anyway. Yeah, he's he's called into our hotline more than anybody else. So I totally recognize his voice. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yes, thank you so much, Dash. So glad you like the people were so excited that we had an actual episode out, even though we didn't talk about anything in it. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much, Dash. We yeah. love the voicemail. And we're going to hopefully get back to our regular schedule now of every two weeks doing another episode. Yep, Skype you for know, now and hopefully in person, maybe in a month or so. I always laugh when I see stuff like, uh, you know, like Brian's podcast that they release an episode like almost every day. <laughs> It's like, wow. I know. Jeez. Like it makes us feel like total slackers. <laughs> but Then we may run out of topics. Exactly, <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. I'm good with our every two weeks. I know some people want us to do more, but two weeks is good. Yeah. So now I'll start researching the next topic. I have no idea right now what it's going to be, but I'll think of something. Okay. So I think that's it. Do we have anything else? We got the deets. Uh, I don't have my pickle book, so I can't tell you a pickle okay, joke. No pickle jokes. Uh, there's no questions we want to answer. I did look. I'll look for next time. Okay, that'll work. Uh, I won't. I was gonna do a pickle joke off the internet, but it's just not the same. It's gotta be from no, a pickle it's joke. Gotta book. be from the book, yeah. So our deets are: if you would like to email us, you can email us at thestrangesessions at gmail dot com. We are on Twitter at Strange Session without the final S. Krista does a great job on Instagram. I love Instagram. I like that people comment more on mm-hmm. Instagram. I, I'm, yeah. That's really awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, Krista does a great job on Instagram at the Strange Sessions. And if you would like to send us postcards or snail mail, you can send it to the Strange Sessions, P.O. Box 434, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, 54221 zero four three four and you can always call and leave a voicemail on our hotline at nine two oh four four three ninety six oh two and i know a couple people have sent us stuff to the p.o box but i think because of the virus stuff it's all slowed down so yeah we'll go check it every couple days so i'll maybe run again this afternoon and see if anything is there it's funny because I'll, I've ordered a few things on Amazon and they give you like an initial, uh, it's going to take two weeks. And then like two days later, I get a Your package is arriving today. <laughs> yep. I guess they're just trying to be, you know, cover all the bases, yeah. make yeah. sure that they don't underestimate or over, you know. Yep. So mail, the snail mail might be a little different, though. Yep. But I, I'll keep checking. So I think that's it. Hopefully Sweet. this episode turns out OK. Uh Again, let us know if it sounds okay. I will be getting a better microphone in the near future. So, I will not. <laughs> Krista will not. <laughs> Just give use my earbuds. <laughs> but hey, it works, it works. Yeah, exactly. So I think that is it for this episode. So from me in my apartment and Krista at her house, until next time, stay, stay strange. <laughs> we get somebody, so I got it before I, I, I stop. It's somebody I don't. I think Carly, my friend Carly that lives here that I worked with, said our stay strange is so awkward now. And I said it's because we're not sitting across from each other. We don't you have know, any visual we cues. We don't have visual cues. <laughs> so we'll try this again. So from Krista and I, <laughs> until next time, stay, stay strange. strange. <laughs> Bye. Bye.